right. Um, nice to meet you, Frank. Nice to meet you. Um, I, gotta, I gotta say, the film's fantastic. Oh, thanks. Um, Thank very you. inspiring. Um, thanks. How did, how did you link up with Alejandro for this? You know, kind of like he says in the film when he was looking for, for Mobius. He was like, ah, oh, how am I going to find him? There's no internet, you know, back mm -hmm. then. I have the internet, so yeah. thank, <laughs> thank goodness. So, um, so a little bit of research and a little bit of searching around a bunch of years ago, and I found uh, he had an agent in Spain. And uh, I contacted, I wrote to his agent, and just said, oh, you know, looking for Alejandro, uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, looking to tell the story of him and Dune. Um, help. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I looks like she forwarded my email on to him, because a few months later, I opened up my email one morning and there was uh, one of the unread messages was labeled Alejandro Jodorowsky. So, terrifyingly, you know, I was like, <laughs> holy crap, and uh, I clicked on it. And uh, it was a very simple message from him where he just said, oh, I hear you're looking for me and you want to do something uh, about Dune. Well, you need to come to Paris and we need to speak face to face. So great. So I bought a plane ticket and went to Paris and... Uh, and met with him, and it kind of just went from there. But it was really just as simple as that. So he seems very open. He seems he's he's totally open. He's totally you know open to everyone and everybody, and you know he's the best. You know. Yeah. It's a, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so how did you decide to to make this? Uh... I, I think that you know the more you kind of learned about it, you read about it in these little you know. And just sort of grow. Yeah, and you kind of yeah, like the more you learn, the more you the more you want to learn. You know, mm -hmm. and how many, how many unmade films feature a cast like his? You know, have Mick Jagger, have David Carradine, have Orson Welles, have Salvador Dali, have Pink Floyd doing the music, or directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky. I mean, it's magma. I mean, that mm -hmm. was something I was completely unaware yeah, of. Yeah, and I, I was unaware of them. I was like, who is this? You know, what the hell is magma? And then once yeah. you see them and hear them, it's like, holy it's crap! It's so inspired. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they sing in their own language. Yeah, they made up their own language to sing. So it's so, you know. It's like, yeah, perfect fit. Right? Yeah, perfect fit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I gotta say the film was the film was uh, it exceeded all my expectations. Oh, you know, great! For real. Um, I'm sure you had some expectations going into it as well. Yeah, so if it's a story that you know. Yeah, you know. I was afraid it was going to be the usual sort of talking head right. thing, but right. um, I mean, it's definitely you know we worked hard to make it. Um, this story could easily be just like a DVD extra, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a, you know, 20 minute featurette on one of the many David Lynch versions yeah, that yeah. are out there, you know, it could have easily been that, or, a, you know, a short documentary on a Jodorowsky box set or something, mm -hmm. but it really, we worked really hard to make it its own thing, to make it its own complete, um, complete film. Well, I found the animation sequences yeah. to be really captivating. Yeah, like, our, our animator is a guy named Sid Garin um, out of LA and he's just amazing. He was just like such a light touch, you know, because it's, you're trying not to add any artwork, you're just trying to take these storyboard images and these paintings and all this kind of artwork and kind of just breathe enough life into them where the viewing audience um, can get a better idea of what yeah, Jodo was going for. Sucked into it, yeah. But also you don't want to show them too much because you want their imagination to carry it further. Because I mean, at the end of the day, it's the storyboards are pencil drawings on, on paper. Absolutely, so yeah. So it's kind of that fine balance. And it's, it's interesting, when I, look at, when I look at the documentary and I look at the animated uh, sequences, uh, each one feels so different. You know, like, the style of each one just feels to have like a different texture to it somehow. That he's really, Sid is really incredible. So he was the perfect guy, the perfect, perfect, perfect guy. Yeah, it for was. This film. It was pretty. Yeah, like uh, like Winding Refn at the beginning, talking about, you know, him sitting down with right. Jodorowsky and him walking him through. Do you want to see Dune? I didn't yeah. know you made Dune. Uh -huh, I did. Yeah, and here's the book. And the the production bible. I had only ever seen you know photos of it in in past. And right. So it was pretty amazing to see all that work. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, it's 3,000 some odd yeah. images are in there. I mean, it's, it's the full movie, yeah. dialogue, everything. Like, it is complete. Um, and that's, you know, that's another reason that we decided, you know, that I thought it was interesting and important to make this movie, because, you know, movies fall apart mm -hmm. every day. You know, every day there's a film that doesn't happen, and usually what is there? It's a couple of screenplay drafts, a casting wish list. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's not the entire thing ready to go. Every single scene completely drawn out, ready to go. 
that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Well, I think someone said it offhandedly in the, in the film, but I think it's true. Like, no, there's probably no un, unmade film that so much work was I don't think so. actually put into yeah. it. Not that I've ever heard of. No, I mean... For sure. And I was just, I was staggered by the yeah, amount of work. years and years. I mean, this is not just, oh, let's get together mm -hmm. for a few months and draw some stuff out. This was years of work and a whole team of people, and, you know. Well, yeah, I think it's great to shine light on that, too, because, I mean, all the, you know, I'd only ever seen the, the Geiger paintings and a couple of the, the Chris Foss paintings. Right. And that's all, you know, I thought that maybe it was a few pieces right, right and and like you're saying like maybe people embellishing these stories but right. then but it's really there i mean no, it's, it's really, really you know really yeah it's 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 complete you could you could open up that book and you read the entire story yeah it's almost you know? I, I mean they take you a while but uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> we said at the very end uh you know it's like it's there almost to be animated in it. yeah it's like uh, and, and someone's contacted him recently a director, a French director, has contacted him and said, I want to make the animated version. That's marvelous. Um, so I wonder if that'll happen. I, don't I mean, know. that would be marvelous. I mean, yeah. I, mean, I was thinking, you know, thinking about Studio Ghibli or, right. you know, and the Incal. I mean, really, yeah. like how... Well, now the Incal, apparently he wants to do it with Refn. Oh. That the two of them would, would do it together. Um, so that'd be pretty... Cause yeah, I mean, it would... be pretty fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how they would do that. Like, I don't even know if the technology is there yet. I don't, I to do that, but but uh, but they want to, and if anyone can do it, those guys, I think. Probably. Yeah, and, and yeah, just him taking that graphic work. I know I felt that in the film. It was like because I've you know spent time with a lot of the graphic work that him and Mobius did. Sure. In the film, I that was I thought that was one of the stronger parts. Oh, he great. Really brought that up, and that you know that to me is a major part of what what he's done. I mean, right. Taking all the that work and then putting it into the yeah. Other I mean, just be, and that's why that's why he's so powerful. It's that. Just because it didn't work out the way that he thought that it would, um, doesn't mean that it's a failure to him. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like no, to him it's not a failure. He's like, look at all my team; they all went on to have wonderful careers. Me too. I took my ideas and I put them into the Incal, I put them into the Meta Barons, I put them into other films. You see them around. It's not a failure. I mean, to him, he says failure is just you have to just change your direction, change the way you're going, and just you know, don't stop. Just keep moving forward. Um, and adapt. Part of his whole psychomagic, right? You know, yeah, transformation. Right? Yeah, exactly. And, and allowing that to happen. Yeah. And I mean, like you said, the team. I mean, where, where it's, they yeah, all, a team of you know, a team of gods yeah, who had never really done too much. No, I, I mean, mean Giger had never worked on a film. <clears throat> no. Dan O'Bannon did Dark Star with John Carpenter. Um, Moby's had never worked on a film, mm -hmm. and Chris Foss had never worked on a film. But he would see the talent in these guys and said, "Oh, these guys are great," you know. And now that's. I think now that's, that's become maybe a little bit more commonplace, that people will reach outside of the film industry to bring in people. But I think then it was really, you know, it was really rare or unheard of. Absolutely. And also yeah. the fact that, you know, probably one of the more striking visual teams. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I thought the end when, uh, when you showed the montage of the, the Hollywood films right. and all the work that was, you know, However much, however it got out however there, however much you know? based, yeah. Um, and there's, there's definitely some questionable ones in there. Like, how did that happen? You know? uh, well, I, it's I, weird. I, yeah. I can't explain. I, some of them you, you can explain, alien mm -hmm. and stuff, sure. But some of them, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised know? if those those production bibles just well, I mean, spent it's like their it's time like if you look at it, around. you know, if all the studios had that book, you know, that's why they created that book, to give it to MGM, to give mm -hmm. a copy to Paramount, to give a copy to Universal, you know, go to their office, drop them off a copy, come back in a couple of weeks, and let's talk about it, and mm -hmm. let's see if you want to make the movie. Um, there was other people at those studios making films. I mean, you know, I, I'm sure, and it's, it's, and it's not a negative thing, but I'm sure that George Lucas took a peek of it. Do I, do I think that he opened it up and was like, oh, I'm gonna steal this? No. No, it's but I think just that, more... I mean, look at, look at Lucas's career pre-Star Wars. I mean, you know, even before American Graffiti, it's like it's THX 1138. It's mm -hmm. a weird, bizarre, avant-garde film. Absolutely. Of course he would be familiar with Jodorowsky. And if, and if he's trying to make his space opera epic, and here comes this other guy coming in mm -hmm. with his space opera epic, I'm, yeah, I'm sure he'd want to go check out and see, well, what the heck is in that book? You Absolutely. Know? So maybe it's just kind of... I mean, everything influences everything. Nothing happens in a vacuum, mm -hmm. um, which is why he's not 
which is why I think he doesn't have this bitter outlook. You know, they yeah. stole from me, they took from me. It's nothing like that at all. It's no, he's not a, rueful it's a wonderful, at all. Yeah, it's a, he's a happy, he's happy to have influenced people and to have influenced other works. He loves it, you know? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's like pushing it forward a little bit. Yeah. As opposed to it, yeah, being authorship or anything yeah, like, like that. Yeah, why let it die, you know? Let, let it keep going out there. His ideas are so powerful. That they're gonna make it out there. I mean, I rewatched, you know, rewatched Holy Mountain, you know, a couple of weeks back. You know, reminding myself that it's, I mean, very small budget films. They really were. They aren't. Yeah. Those films were very small budget, and that he was able to do that work with so little. But then, you know, they're monumental works that right. he's looking to do. So. They're massive. Yeah, they're small, but they're massive also. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, maybe maybe that's really maybe that's part of the, his psycho magic. Well, it's, I mean, it's just like it's like when Lynch made his version of Dune. I mean, you know, he'd made much like Jodorowsky. He was, you know, he was on his on his tails. He'd made Eraserhead. He'd made The Elephant Man. And then he made the biggest movie up until that point. I mm -hmm. mean, is that is that always the best guy to give it to? You know, just because someone is so incredibly talented, like Jodorowsky is, like Lynch is, maybe they don't work. Maybe their talents can't shine through under a corporate system, under a massive, you know, what was, what was Lynch's doing? Like $50 million or something yeah, at that time? I think at least. I mean, it was crazy. crazy. Yeah. Totally crazy. And the guy that made <laughs> Eraserhead. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, the like, Elephant Man yeah. as, the, as the CD yeah. for it. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, I mean, I, I, also, uh, I remember reading the story years ago about uh, Hodorowsky and, and his son going to see it finally. Right. And, you know, and him being very relieved. I had read an interview with him at some point where he had said that he, he went to the theater and he was so uncomfortable and so, ner and so nervous that he broke out into hives. And then as the film went on, the film, the film gave him the hives, but the film also cured him of his hives because he was so happy with how bad it was. <laughs> so it's like powerful, you know, Absolutely. I guess. You know. Yeah, and like the two, no, like the two and a half hour format. I mean, like, have you read Dune? Are you familiar with? Yeah, that? I mean, actually, yeah. Big. Yeah, it's, it's got a hundred page glossary. Yeah, I mean, it's a big, massive book. It's not a, you know. No, it is not a two hour movie, two and a half hour movie. When we when we interviewed Gary Kurtz, he said he doesn't know how you'd make that film into a successful film. He said maybe take a part of it, maybe you know do something, take part of that world and do a piece of it, but to try and adapt that whole book into one film, it's, it's an impossibility. Yeah. As we see time and time again, you know. Yeah, because I mean, I guess they've done, they did a television. They did like a TV miniseries in the States, the, like a sci-fi channel thing, which, which has its fans, as does mm -hmm. Lynch's Dune. Yeah. Um, you know, people would like to put out there that Lynch's Dune is, you know, reviled by everybody and everybody hates it, but people, there's a lot of people that really, really love it. It has um, its strange moments. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And there's definitely some really interesting things that Lynch created. Mm -hmm. um, that Lynch created in the film. Mm -hmm. um, so they, everything has its fans. You know, and then what, who, what Peter Berg was going to do a version? Oh, really? Recently. That was the last thing, I think. It was Peter. No, I think P, uh, Pierre Morel was going to do a version a couple years ago. And then, I, and then I think it went to Peter Berg. And then the option lapsed and the studio lost it and he went back to the owner, whoever the owner is now. Um, and then Peter Berg wanted to go do uh, Battleship. So it's a, it's a very difficult adaptation. Well, and, I mean, maybe this is the form that it almost has to take, yeah. almost like a, like a tall tale. Yeah. That's sort of how I felt watching the film. It was almost like, it's like maybe this is really what this was. Yeah, I mean, where, you know, what way. should the project have been? Should it have been the, you know, two hour, three hour, 12 hour, 20 hour version, whatever it was gonna be? Or was it meant to just, you know, was it meant to end at that book and then be picked up 30 some odd years later into this documentary, which then feeds back into the system. And because we made this documentary, because we, um, we had Alejandro and Michelle Sudu, both in the film, mm -hmm. and we managed to kind of reunite them after so many years, because they hadn't seen each other since 1976, since Dune fell apart. And because of that reunion uh, of the two of them, we have a new Jodorowsky film. We have La Danza, which is completed. So it's, mm -hmm. well, it kind of keeps giving back. Well, yeah, it's the, Dude is the gift that keeps on giving, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. We're in like a bit of a Jodorowsky uh, renaissance, a little well, tiny I mean, if, bit now. If you, think of, if you think of Khan this year, there was, obviously there was our film, there was Jodorowsky's mm -hmm. Dune. Um, it premiered and it was followed immediately by La Danza the second film, mm -hmm. 
The third film that he's connected to in the festival was Blue is the Warmest Color, because Brontus' daughter is in that film. Oh, yeah, new and new the fourth film to be connected to Jodorowsky is Refn's uh, yeah, Only, Only God, God Forgives, Forgives, because it's dedicated to him. It's the first credit at the end of the film, before directed by, before anything, it's for my friend Alejandro Jodorowsky. So he's represented, represented four times in one festival, in, the, in you know, arguably, arguably the biggest festival in the world. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's a crazy, you know, it was all meant to be, 2013. It was okay. all meant, I guess, to funnel into this year. I don't, know, I don't know how else to explain it. Yeah, I mean, he's been slowly bubbling up yeah. over the last few years with, uh, well, with the publication of Danza, the book, right. a few years back, right. and the box set, finally. Well, it's like, I mean, I have the box set, and I love it, it's great, but I, but I've, I, mean, I love to look at it. I've mm -hmm. never actually popped in any of the DVDs, because I, I like to watch his films, um, to me, the way they're meant to be seen, you know, on, a, on a, the big screen, in a darkened room full of strangers, preferably at midnight. I, mean, yeah. I think that's the, way to, that's the way to do it, you know. It's, it's, it's too easy to dismiss a film to watch, you know, on DVD or, God forbid, on your computer monitor. You know, yeah. God forbid. You know, you need to see it up there. You yeah. need to see it, you know, larger than life. And they're great, and they yeah. just, you know, they, they give so much um, when you see them like that. Now they've been remastered and rebuilt and recolored, and they're just and they like... they look astonishing. Astonishing. Like, like, El Topo looks amazing. The, the sky colors, oh. the sand, it's just, it's incredible. Even it's like it was made yesterday. It's huh? really like it was made yesterday, because his films are so otherworldly. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, they are products of their period, they are products of the 70s, but they also totally transcend that I totally because agree it's, with it, you. it's its own world it doesn't play, it doesn't take place in a New York City 1972 it takes place in, in the Jodoverse mm -hmm. in his own made up <laughs> wild imagination whatever is going on in his head mm -hmm. so they really can play as well then as they will today as they will you know 40 years from now I yeah. think I think they've aged incredibly well yeah um, even the commentary he's making on that time period mm -hmm. So many things in Holy Mountain. The 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 was it the um, the weapons manufacturer oh. and all that. It's like uh, hello. What are we looking at today? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's drones and all these horrible horrible things. It all kind of you know he was touching on it all the way back then. It's incredible. He's amazing. Yeah. I mean, he's yeah, truly visionary. It's like you know, in many ways, I feel like the work he was doing, you know, including the Dune. It's like maybe it was just too just too forward and too. Just too beyond for people to yeah. really grasp. It's almost like he was, he's almost like the filmmaker we need, but you know, but we, right. it's not quite what we deserve. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's you know, good. I like that. You know, and that's great. Maybe that's why, you know, he can be like the octogenarian who's, who's still know, vibrant, still yeah. going. And I couldn't believe how ebullient and just on it he is yeah. in the film. I mean, you, did you see his? Did you see his new film? I haven't seen it yet. It's I haven't crazy. Had a chance it's totally to. like the yeah. He's eighty-four years old, shooting a film, making it. It's again, it's incredible. He just keeps going, and you see him and doing it. He's like, he's not. He's not eighty-four years old. He's eighty-four years young. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's totally outlasting everybody. Just keeping going every day, creating every day. You know, he's got his. You know, his. You know, eight hundred thousand Twitter followers or whatever, and he just puts out poems to them every day and challenges, and he has this real communication with people. You know, it's funny, when I, when I was trying to contact him um, before, you know, before successfully reaching out by his agent, and I, uh, he was, I was living in New York at the time, and he was giving us a speech there, or a psychomagic course mm -hmm. or something. I was like, oh, I've got to go see this. And I remember it was pouring, pouring, pouring rain, like torrential <laughs> downpours. This is four years ago or something like that. I was like, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go, you know, see him. Like, how many people, it wasn't like a huge advertised thing. It wasn't the front page of the paper, obviously. I was like, I'm gonna go see him. Like, how many people can really be there? And I go there, and in the pouring rain, there was the line down the block, turns the corner, that whole side, and everyone's just standing in the freezing cold, waiting, slowly moving to go in. And uh, so I'm waiting online with everyone else, and I get within, within 10 people, within eight or 10 people of the door, and Okay, thank you. No, awful. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I missed my chance then. But I was like, but I remember being so invigorated too. Like, wow, there's, you know, people really love him. People really want to see him. And then um, after we were shooting, you know, for a year or so, he came to New York. 
and he was doing uh, he was being feted. They they screened Holy Mountain at uh, at the Museum of Modern Art uh, on Halloween, strangely. And it was the craziest <laughs> audience. Remember, it was sitting in. He was. I was sitting to the side, and it was Yoko Ono, Jodo's wife, and Jodo. A couple seats down was Martha Stewart, and in front of Martha Stewart was Courtney Love. And then it was all full of people in Halloween costumes because they were going to be going to the parade. So it was a really weird, really weird showing. But there was that screening, um, and then he, and then they also showed El Topo at Lincoln Center. Um, but for the screening at Museum of Modern Art. Um, They'd sold out tickets a few weeks before, you know, within five minutes. Everything was gone on the internet, and they held a certain amount for sale the morning of. So the doors of the museum opened up at, you know, 10 o'clock, I think, or something. So I got there, like, you know, an hour and a half early. I was like, oh, look. I could obviously, you know, tell him that oh, to put me on the list or whatever. I was like, ah, it's weird. I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go get in line with everyone else. So I got in line, and I was, you know, I got there like an hour and a half, two hours early. Um, before the museum opened up in the morning, and there was probably 30 or 40 in line. By the time the doors were ready to open, there was hundreds of people online, and when those doors opened, there was no single file line of people, <laughs> adults walking into the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It was every man for himself. People were punching, kicking, throwing babies to the ground, stepping on people's heads. It was horrible, and they all went running into the lobby to the desk to buy the tickets, and that's when the museum said, I'm sorry, we only have eight tickets available. And they couldn't have told people that beforehand. They needed hundreds of people yep. to line up online. But it was insane to watch the ferocity of these people. It um, sounds like scenes out of his movie. Yeah, totally. It, it, it was really, exactly yeah, what it was. It was, it was insane. These people were living the Jodorowsky movie. And I was like, I'm not one of the first eight people, so I'm not going to go fight with anyone. Like, this is insane. I kind of just walked away and just watched it. Like, like a viewer, yeah, like a viewer watching the cast of, you know, of anything. It was crazy, of any of his films. It was really amazing. But people love him. People will fight um, to be in the same room with him, to be able to see him. Um, I remember when he was at, when he presented La Danza at, at Cannes, there was a, you know, the question and answer afterwards, and this girl raised her hand, and she was just weeping, like weeping, weeping, weeping. And she said, oh, your film touched me so much. I just want to come up and give you a hug. Is that okay? He goes, of course. And this girl comes up and just gave him like this sob ridden hug, like just loved it so much. And she was this young girl. She was 20, 22 or something like that. Um, so he touches people of all ages um, and of all backgrounds um, and of all histories. It's really, he's, his scope is so wide, so broad, while also being so specific. It's a really, he doesn't go for the lowest common denominator. But, but he touches something in, I don't know, in people's souls or something. It's, he's incredible. His therapeutic work, it's, it's really incredible stuff that he is doing. Have you read Psychomagic? Or, yeah, yeah and I, I've seen films of the session. Right. And it really is moving, yeah. moving stuff. Yeah. And yeah, I, I don't know, maybe I see this all as an extension in many ways of what he's doing, talking about his you know, the actions to yeah. rectify trauma and all these things. Yeah. And just how he can connect with people in this. And that's what it's about. I mean, that, that's how he lives his life. He's like, you know, he wants to help people, like you say, to rectify their trauma, to get over these horrible things, just like he did with Dune. I mean, when Dune collapsed in 76, it must have been absolutely devastating for him. You know, now he kind of plays it off like, ah, oh, it was no big deal, it was meant to be. But I'm sure for a long time he was in pain and he was hurting and he had to work mm -hmm. through that to try and find the positive thing and how are we going to do this? How am I going to keep going? I know we're going to make the income together. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It, it's work. You know, he knows and that's what his therapy is about, I think. It's helping people to work through these things. Yeah, he says it in the film, I think, at one point that he would have just died. Mm -hmm. I think and he says that at some point. He was, uh, no, but it's, it's, it's Mobius that asks. Oh, it's, like, oh. you know, he's like, what, so what's going to happen now? Are you going to die? Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not going to die. No, I'm going oh, to create We're going to keep creating. Yeah, you know? yeah. But Mobius, I think, was looking at him like, oh my God, what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, Mobius is like, hey, man, I have my comic book business to go back to. Chris Foss could go back to his mm -hmm. you know, sci-fi paperback covers. Uh, Dan O'Bannon had other projects. He was writing Alien. He went to go mm -hmm. work on Star Wars afterwards. He was a special effects guy. Mm -hmm. He had that. What was 
Joe Dorowski going to do? Because he had to create. He couldn't jump onto somebody else's project. Mm -hmm. He needs to create his own. And how do you start again? How do you start creating after something so so devastating? But he did it. You know, it's not a serious story. You know, mm -hmm. it's just like his films, like Holy Mountain, has a lot of serious themes in there, but it's also hilarious. Oh, absolutely. And the movie is hilarious. And that's how Dune is, too. There's many, you know, belly laugh moments um, that happen in our film, um, as well as touching moments and different things. But it's definitely, it's definitely entertaining, I think. Mm -hmm. um, whoever he comes in contact with, he, he alters their life for the better. It's incredible. Psychomagic. Like Exactly. At work. Yeah, it's like a magic at work. Exactly. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.